there are forests being extinguished very soon. I believe it's in that direction that we should go. Maybe not only the media, as we heard, because I don't think it's enough, but huge campaigns talking to the people of the countries in order to push their governments to do something. And basically, we have five months to do it before Copenhagen. Otherwise, it will be huge speeches and no action again. Before you sit down, can I clarify, are you talking about this political pressure within the countries themselves? In other words, much more from the bottom up. We have to put, in my opinion, the political pressure in every country. Because they are also rich and powerful people in the weak and poor countries. So it's everywhere that the rich and powerful people should find their own personal interest to do it. If they are finding some profit in doing it, they will do it. If they find some people voting for them, they will do it. If they get good compliments in the media, they will do it. But if they don't find a personal interest, they will not do it. So let's give them an interest to do it. Let's give them an advantage. Let's push a trend that will make these people feel well because they commit themselves. Thank you. Could you pass the microphone back to Sir John Holmes, please? I'm the uh, Emergency Relief Coordinator and I was chairing the Global Platform on Disaster Risk Reduction which Senator Lagarde was talking about just now. Just three quick points perhaps to bring us back to the, the current consequences of climate change as opposed to the mitigation agenda. I, mean, I think it's, it's very easy to fall into fatalism and, and the feeling you can do nothing about this. Actually, we can do something about it. Of course we can do something about it. emissions as, we, as people have just been saying and we have to do that, that's absolutely fundamental. But we can also do things about the current consequences of climate change by measures such as disaster risk reduction. You can't stop the natural hazard, you can't stop the flood, the cyclone, the drought, uh, at least not easily uh, until you sort emissions out, but you can make sure that it doesn't turn into a total disaster by what you do in terms of action on the ground in terms of reforestation, water management, making sure people don't live in floodplains, all the measures that we can take and must take. The second point, therefore, is that uh, if we're going to, to, to achieve that, there has to be some resources there. If there's going to be some resources there, we have to make sure that in Copenhagen we're not only talking about mitigation, reduction of emissions, fundamental that is, but we're also talking about adaptation. Adaptation doesn't drop off the agenda as it tends to do. And we have to get that message across to the negotiators in Copenhagen, the national experts, the international experts, so they all get together. So there's no gap between the, 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 the climate change negotiators on the mitigation side and the disaster managers as well. Uh, they're all together and, and it's one negotiation. And if that negotiation about adaptation is going to succeed, there's got to be resources to go with it, which is the third point. Of course, we can do things, as, as uh, Lauren Lagarde was saying, like uh, putting 10% of what we pay for disaster risk reduction, uh, sorry, for, for uh, 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 response to disasters and reconstruction after disasters to disaster risk reduction, or 1% of development aid. But that isn't going to be enough, and it also leads you into a real problem about uh, an argument between development uh, and climate change uh, efforts. I mean, they're not in contradiction, but they can be put there if we're not careful. So we need to have some kind of adaptation financing mechanism which is much more automatic and generating much more resources by using part of the proceeds of carbon emissions trading, carbon taxation, whatever the mechanism might be, it's got to be there, it's got to be automatic and generating resources that can then be used to address the, the consequences of climate change for people right now. Let me pick up on those three points. We heard contraction and convergence, the need for much more pressure on that from you as nations at risk, the political pressure in any country, more bottom-up pressure, more from the, the public. You talked to uh, Senator Lagarde about the, the problems on logging that you would face, uh, even though it's recognized as a significant problem. And that final point about more adaptation uh, on these issues. Mr. President. Uh, I just want to endorse, of course, and I'm really attracted to the idea of trying to destabilize governments which will not uh, uh, participate in the process. And I, quite frankly, at one stage, I was talking to the people of a country because the, their governments would not listen to what we were doing, what, we were, what our problem was. And I think uh, this is exactly what you're saying, but I think um, what, what you're suggesting is let's do it on a more massive scale. Let's focus on those countries which refuse to, to move on this issue and um, try to get them interested. And if not, 
you know, get somebody who is interested. But I think the reality is this, um, we have to deal with this problem. It's the biggest challenge, the biggest danger to mankind. And I think there's too much at stake not to allow it to, to, allow it to happen. Senator Lagarde. Okay. Of course, I agree with all the views mentioned, and I think um, it's about time that uh, world leaders, political leaders, uh, even leaders in the community must rethink development that must be not only sustainable but also adaptable and um, equitable. And we must make sure that um, developed nations must assist the um, developing nations in terms of adaptation. Maybe in the least developed nations, um, which will be gone in 40 years, mitigation is no longer an issue since uh, the science is irreversible. But uh, something must be done, uh, like a big brother approach, where the developed nations must adopt in some way, um, let's say the people of the Maldives or Kiribati or the other nations, in terms of um, providing them the land, um, training them so that they will be equipped with uh, skills and uh, livelihoods when they migrate to a certain areas, and um, to be able also to protect and preserve and promote the cultures that will be lost in less than a, in four decades for historians to actually chronicle uh, the culture that will be lost in 40 years. And this political pressure, the, 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 the pressure which we heard of there. Of course, political pressure must be done internationally and uh, nationally as well. Uh, gentleman is correct that uh, pressure must, must not be stopped. And that pressure, since all of these talks, uh, whether it's the HFA, the Yoga Framework for Action, or whether it's the Kyoto Protocol or the talks in Copenhagen, there is clearly no punitive action. And if the uh, the big nations don't comply, we just say, I'm sorry. They just say, I'm sorry, we can't comply because we're so industrialized. The U.S., uh, of course, we, we herald uh, the new age in the United States with a great leader. But they, are they actually going to comply even with the levels of the first commitment of the Kyoto Protocol? That we need to ask. Their, their rationalization or justification is there is domestic action being done, but is that enough? They must really have deeper cuts and commit to those uh, deeper cuts uh, which other countries are going to do. The final word on nations at risk, the most vulnerable nations which we've been discussing for the last hour and a half. From the standpoint of uh, the four nations at risk, uh, I want to qualify this by the insertion of the word poor, because uh, I believe all nations are at risk, uh, but some perhaps can do more for themselves than others. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, we agree totally that uh, the rich and powerful nations should assume more of the responsibility in uh, helping adapt to the onslaught. But the nations at risk particularly, which we're talking about here. The, well, I appreciate it, but I'm saying that unless we qualify the topic by letting everybody accept that we are all at risk, it's a global problem and we must tackle it glo globally. Unless we are, see that, some nations might think they are not uh, uh, on the front line, so they can drag their feet. And on this basis, I would say that perhaps a central authority should be put in place, and I would suggest the UN, to exact the penalties where uh, the polluters are concerned, so that the fund would go into uh, the adaptation fund, as suggested by the Senator, for disbursements to the poor nations to empower them to do something about adapting to uh, the changes needed. So uh, the central authority, I believe, should be an issue concerning all of us. We shouldn't leave it to the individual rich nations to give as and when they please. There should be an overarching authority, ideally based in the United Nations, saying to all nations respecting the conventions and paying up where they are at fault so the justice would be done objectively, not uh, on the, the, the whims and caprices of some countries. Uh, that one would not be acceptable.